All right, welcome back, everybody. How was lunch? Okay, yes? All right, good. So, what we have next is our millennial panel. Um, what we see very frequently in the market today is a growth in interest in transparency, but specifically among a certain generation of consumers. And we have invited a group of all younger players in the cocoa industry to speak with us about the importance of transparency and specialty pricing. I am going to both present and moderate on this panel. And so I'm actually going to begin by talking about transparent trade and impact measurement more broadly, specifically looking at the specialty cacao and chocolate supply chain. So let's begin, and here we go. What we see today is a growth in reporting and transparency along specific lines in the industry. And if you look here, you can see a few examples. What you see, for example, are some of the commitments that Taza Chocolate um, in my hometown in the Boston area makes, where they, for example, say that they have direct relationships with farmers, they pay a certain premium above the commodity price, uh, they buy based on quality, fermentation, and moisture level, they are certified organic, and they also publish an annual transparency report, which if you have not seen it, is an important document in this space. We then also see different types of examples. They, they don't look exactly the same, but they're also attempting to track different things or to speak differently about what they do. And Valrona chocolate, we heard from Pierre Coste earlier today, is an example in this space where they have partnerships in 11 countries. They've engaged in 17 community projects since 2012. They have a responsible purchasing charter that you can view online. Um, they have specific goals for reducing energy and water consumption, and they're working on the cacao forest, which you learned about earlier. And then, of course, we have an example like Theo Chocolate. Theo Chocolate is based in Seattle, Washington. They engage in their own type of transparency on the supply chain that involves third-party auditing, quality premiums, transparency into pricing, uh, sp uh, various specifications around quality, their fair trade and organic, and they make regular visits to farms. This is just a snapshot of the different types of reporting that companies are using as a way to communicate how they operate. What we've done at FCCI is actually survey a large group of these different types of reporting. And we've looked at the certification agencies or corporate sustainability programs. You see these in the middle left column to see what kinds of things they prioritize as important. And what I mean by certification agencies or corporate social uh, sustainability programs is these are things like UTZ, Rainforest Alliance, uh, the work of Coco Life from Mondelez, and so on. We also then look at individual manufacturers or chocolate makers and what they release in their reporting. And you can see here a different set of priorities. And what I think is particularly interesting to note is that when it comes to specialty chocolate manufacturers who are primarily represented in this middle right column, quality or flavor is primary for them in their reporting. You can also see then ecological practices are very frequently listed, producer or organization, or orga producer organization training, and so on. And if you look at the other side, the middle left column, what you see is a very different list of priorities. Now, many people are talking about many of the same things, but the way they're talking about them is different. And what we've identified as key gaps and areas for improvement are the following. For example, we lack a unified definition of quality or flavor when it's reported by different groups. We lack data sharing in relation to direct relationships. If people claim to have a direct relationship with producers, what does that mean? Are they willing to share data on how they have these relationships and what they entail? We lack a lot of data collection in other areas or other data sharing. We lack a unified definition of this indicator on ecological practices, which you can see is important in both the larger private sector 
literature or certification schemes and in specialty chocolate reporting. So there's a lot to continue to do in this space. And a lot of it has to do with trying to standardize the way in which we measure and communicate about things. Now, if you remember the last chocolate conservatory, and many of you were there, what we identified as things that the market lacks are as follows. It lacks an industry definition of fine or craft chocolate. Likewise, it lacks standards for defining specialty or fine cacao. It lacks differentiation from or within the so-called premium chocolate sector. And by that I mean, how do you tell the difference between something that is made with cacao that met a particular quality standard and a chocolate bar that is wearing a very nice costume but could be made with anything? Beyond that, we are lacking a lot of data collection and verifiability and transparency into cacao and chocolate production size and pricing. This, in many industries, is not a surprising amount of transparency. In the coffee industry, this has become increasingly transparent, especially over the past five to 10 years. And then finally, we lack the institutional resources to support collecting and publishing any of these statistics. Any time a project like this is undertaken, it requires a really massive input of resources in order to do it well and to do it consistently. Consistently. I'm happy to report that some of these things have advanced since the last Chocolate Conservatory. The International Standards for the Assessment of Cocoa Quality and Flavor, that's I-S-A-C-Q-F, is a working group of different partners that have slowly and ploddingly been working toward the completion of cocoa quality standards that might be internationally accepted. So we're an active member of that group and participate. Um, and the, the members of the group are, are also here in this room. Uh, they're also here in Paris as part of the Salon de Chocolat and the Cocoa of Excellence, the International Cocoa Awards. And if you visit this website, Cocoa Quality standards.org, you can actually see some of the early drafts of these standards. They're currently available only in English. They will be translated into at least Spanish and French shortly. And you can actually provide your feedback on these early standards. And we strongly encourage you to consider doing that. So we're happy to report that growth is occurring and movement is happening toward international quality standards. Beyond that, we also track things as well as we can uh, at FCCI based on our own scholarly definitions of specialty cacao and chocolate. Those are available on our website. They are not things that have been internationally agreed upon, but they do meet a scholarly standard for divining and measuring something. And if you visit our website here, chocolateinstitute.org slash resources slash map, what you can find is our ever increasing list of different operations that are engaged in working with specialty cacao per that scholarly definition we work with. So there is more information, it is becoming more regularly collected, and we are making making progress toward better international standards. At the same time, we are championing flavor very heavily in the specialty industry. And these are just a few of the different kinds of headlines that have come out over the past few years. We have six ways craft chocolate is disrupting the food industry, talking about rescuing chocolate in Tabasco, Mexico. The Caribbean fine chocolate industry is about to explode. Fine-tuning cocoa yields chocolate with richer flavor or aroma. Um, a question about about what was the world's most exquisite chocolate, claiming it came from Peru, what makes the world's most expensive chocolate worth the price. You can see that there is increasingly consumer awareness and media coverage around specialty cacao and chocolate. But again, it comes with a lot of question marks and it comes with a lot of, I think, sometimes hyperbole. It is often the case that we are making very large claims about things that remain very small in their impact.
And what we are likely to run into is actually a credibility conundrum. We're also beginning, we're already beginning to see some whisperings of this in relation to specialty cacao and chocolate. The issue with any claim by any product or service is the assumption of credibility. Now, when it comes to certification schemes, Rainforest Alliance, UTZ, Fair Trade, and so on, increasingly, we are aware that they generally show that certification leads to heterogeneous effects within and among villages based upon how producers respond. Challenges are faced by producers are often downplayed. And so there is increasingly consumer apathy or discomfort with what the claims are that are made about these certification schemes. And many marketing experts agree that consumers are actually reaching burnout and are more skeptical about standards than ever before. One example of this came in relation to a book rate written about the fair trade labeling movement. The Economist reviewed the book and made the following claim, the fair trade labeling movement has been more about easing consciences in rich countries than making serious inroads into poverty in the developing world. Now, of course, this isn't to throw out certifications. They have had measurable impact and in important ways, but it is to say that the credibility conundrum exists in relation to certifications. It can in very short order also exist in relation to specialty cacao and chocolate. Now, a variety of industries have found ways to use transparency to try to address this credibility conundrum. One that has been particularly interesting to follow is this one. It is the apparel and footwear supply chain transparency pledge. You can find this online. And what it requires is a bare minimum of transparency from a major apparel and footwear companies where they are required to submit to their peers information about their sourcing that meets certain standards of transparency. And they then are able to use this pledge as a way of communi communicating to consumers that they engage in this kind of transparency. It helps them with the various claims that they make about the significance of their sourcing practice. Practices. There's also this example, the Specialty Coffee Transaction Guide. And this is published, it's been published for a few years now, where a number of coffee, specialty coffee buyers will share information about the prices that they pay for the coffee, often also linked with the quality score that that coffee received. That information is anonymized and aggregated and then published so that people can take it and use it and try to better understand pricing in particular regions or around particular quality levels of coffee. And this has, since its publication, now been accom accompanied by a similar transparency pledge that specialty coffee companies are signing together that involves a peer review of their transparency. And what they have found so far is that it requires a great deal of communication and education, but consumers do respond positively to it. So we have been imagining ways that we might think of similar or analog systems for tracking specialty cacao pricing and transparency and data collection. And what we have been thinking about and are loosely proposing is the idea of something like a cacao observatory where essentially it would set up a consortium of cacao and chocolate companies that share common goals. And with those common goals, they would be able to build together an online platform accessible by the members of the consortium, perhaps eventually accessible by people who would like to read or learn about what that data represents, and that would allow them to compile existing information from select origins, taking in mind relevant ethical and business considerations. This would mean collecting data and sharing that data among the consortium of members to determine whether or not the claims that members are making or would like to make about what they do are actually substantiated by the data. And the types of indicators, the things that we propose measuring, are quite complex but fall under a few basic categories. They involve looking at things like farm structure, looking at labor, cacao revenue, 
cacao quality, especially now that international standards are closer to being developed. Ecological practices and then price, and price broken down, farm gate price, FOB price, and so on. And were we able to actually compare these different indicators across regions and across sourcing operations, we might be able to make some much more serious judgments about the feasibility or the success of various projects that exist today. Because what we learn from similar industries is that increasingly, specialty does not solve many of the problems that we would like to claim that it solves. For example, in coffee, it has been found that the cost of producing a high quality coffee is so high that in fact producers, even when receiving a quality premium, are not meeting the certain needs that they might need to meet. They might, that might mean uh, meeting a living income requirement. It might mean that they are not able to invest in their communities. So there are a variety of other things that they're limited by because of the high cost of producing a premium or high quality coffee. And that's the kind of thing that we hope could be avoided in many specialty cacao operations with the appropriate data collection and sharing. Now, at the same time, the world of flavor itself has gone topsy-turvy. In the world of wine, where flavor has been championed more than ever before, the word terroir was born here in France. And the word terroir pops up in dictionaries anytime the French feel threatened by about their wine industry, right? So terroir is very much linked with the socio-political situation of any given time and how the French are feeling about whether their wine is succeeding. We have examples like the Comité Champagne or the Institut National de l'Origine et de la Qualité which are both focused on defining what can be called champagne or how things can operate. They're a type of um, professionalization and standardization of these products. There's also the Wine and Spirits Educational Trust, which offers certifications to people that say, you have proved to us that you can taste and describe using a particular vocabulary with a degree of accuracy that we accept. And this is an important professional certification for people. What's quite interesting about this is these work well here in Europe but they may not work as well in other places. And even as they work well here in Europe, they are under a difficult situation right now. For example, terroir is increasingly debated. What is the meaning of terroir in wine? I thought this particular quote was useful to take in, into account. Great wines taste like they come from somewhere. Lesser wines are interchangeable. They could come from anywhere. And increasingly, this kind of debate or argument over what terroir means is happening in the world of wine. In fact, the word sommelier has become increasingly hard to define. And even among the different camps of different types of wine sommeliers, people are now at odds with one another about what it means to be a sommelier, about what kind of certification you need to be a sommelier. So we can't simply take the case of wine and apply it wholesome to chocolate because the situations are so entirely different and also because wine is not a snapshot. It is something that is moving and changing all the time and that is in itself at debate today. So what I would like to pose for discussion, and we can talk about this all together later, is were we to do something like this, where we tried to better track data so that our decisions would be more informed what would be the indicators of most interest to us? What sourcing origins would be the first for pilots? What kind of cost sharing for data collection and reporting would be possible? And because we already have so many standards, we think that is something we might want to avoid here. What are options for sharing credible information with consumers that don't require yet another standard with the high cost of becoming standardized that often accompanies it? Thank you. All right.
right. So next, I would like to invite Roy Fratz to the stage. Roy is here posing as Stasi Baranoff on your program. Stasi is unfortunately not feeling well and one that was unable to travel to Paris. Um, but Roy, who works with Cacao Verapaz and Uncommon Cacao and is deeply expert in everything that they do, has kindly agreed to step in and to discuss transparency in Uncommon Cacao's model. And Roy will be speaking in Spanish, so if you would like to put on your headphones, you'll now be prepared. Thank you very much, Carla. Hola a todos, buenas tardes, ¿cómo están? Bueno, tres razones por las que voy a hablar en español. Una porque es mi idioma natal, la otra porque me siento más cómodo y, y con la capacidad de compartir más mis conocimientos y emociones. Y el tercero porque es un idioma muy bonito y que les va a quitar el sueño porque esta hora es pesada, normalmente después del almuerzo, entonces donde estemos, sea en Centroamérica, América o Europa, siempre da un poco de sueño. Muy bien, eh, como lo dijo Carla, mi nombre es Roy Fratz, eh, soy de Guatemala, trabajo para Cacao Verapaz eh, y un Common Cacao también. Eh, actualmente pues estaré presentando lo que en su momento también iba a ser eh, Stasi, pero por razones ahí de, de salud no pudo, no pudo acompañarnos. Bueno, eh, realmente el tema de, de transparencia eh, es un tema nuevo para, para muchas personas, sobre todo en la industria o la cadena de valor del cacao. Eh, puede ser tomado de diferentes maneras, puede usar el nombre de comercio transparente, eh, comercio con transparencia o reportes de transparencia. Eh, ustedes podrán ver por ahí la foto de Sebastián Tiul, él es eh, presidente de una asociación de productores pequeños de cacao en Guatemala, eh, específicamente en Cabón, es el, es el municipio. Y pues comentándoles, para comentarles un poco, eh, un común cacao pues está constituido desde el 2010 eh, por Maya Mountain Cacao Group, que es en Belice. Eh, y desde el 2014 en Guatemala como Cacao Era Paz y entre el 2016 al 2019 eh, se han unido a nosotros eh, eh, actores claves como Pisa en Haití, Latitude Trade de Uganda, Cacao Hunters de, de Colombia, eh, Oco Caribe de República Dominicana, Aboca que es en, en Ghana, eh, Uopro Cae en Ecuador y el Alto Beni en Bolivia. Ellos son eh, los socios estratégicos en Guatemala y Belice poseemos eh, oficina y bodegas eh, eh, directas o administradas de manera directa por un common. En los demás eh, países que, que les he mencionado después, eh, solo se tiene un joint venture o se tiene un partnership con ellos para lograr eh, llegar al, a los objetivos comunes. Eh, ¿Por qué transparencia? Eh, esto actualmente para algunos puede ser una moda, un movimiento, pero ya para otros como los que estamos acá y yo personalmente ya es un hecho. Eh, lo que busca la transparencia eh, básicamente es conectar a productores con consumidores, pero no solo un simple link, un, una simple conexión, sino que una, una conexión que se mueva, que tenga eh, una entrada, una salida, una retroalimentación. También remueve estructuras designadas eh, de, de manera histórica, eh, de manera colonial en algunos eh, países eh, pues de Latinoamérica o de África. También promueve mucho el, el, el diálogo en las personas, promueve esa retroalimentación entre consumidores o los eh, chocolate, chocolate makers o los, o los chocolatiers con los productores. Y pues todo esto hace que haya cambios, cambios hacia adelante y hacia atrás, eh, Siendo transparentes podemos decir las cosas de manera muy, muy directa, de manera muy honesta. Personalmente creo que lo que buscamos al establecer esta, eh, esta relación es una relación no a mediano plazo o a corto, sino buscando un largo plazo, eh, construyendo una, una relación transparente eh, a través del tiempo. Eh, bueno, básicamente el comercio transparente es que sea, pues, los precios sean verificables, que sean publicables y que toda transacción relacionada a la venta o compra de, de cacao o a lo largo de la cadena 
de valor incluye información de quién la produjo o dónde se produjo ese cacao y dónde. Eh, eso es lo que, lo que busca como factores principales la transparencia. ¿Quién y en dónde? Para nosotros en el modelo que, que tenemos como un coma. Desde que se pues, eh, construyó o estableció la eh, filial de Maya Mountain Cacao en Belice, eh, se trae este reporte de transparencia o, o el, el comercio transparente muy dentro de su ADN o, o como parte integral y estructural de la misma, donde se establecen eh, para un nuevo origen o en, eh, para diferentes alcances, nosotros lo que buscamos es que haya calidad, una relación con el productor y que hayan precios altos en, en mercados especiales. Eh, nuestros reportes anuales de transparencia eh, tienen pues, los, como primera instancia el precio pagado a los productores y lo que buscamos también es que haya una lealtad, eh, la transparencia y la honestidad en los grupos eh, y a, hacia, hacia un común lo que, no, que busca es que, que creemos una relación de lealtad, de respeto y de admiración, sobre todo de quienes producen eh, los granos de cacao. Bueno, por ahí hay una gráfica donde se comparan los diferentes precios, bueno, el, el precio de exportación eh, de un común, que es el precio pagado al exportador, está también el precio, eh, lo que se le paga al productor, está el ingreso pagado al productor, está el, eh, sorry, el, también el, el precio pues, del, del mercado, el precio de bolsa de como commodity y está un promedio del precio en costa de, de marfil y, y gana eh, en, en precios pagados al productor. Entonces, eh, lo que buscan también estos reportes de transparencia es hacer comparación entre los diferentes precios a nivel mundial para poder establecer eh, la diferencia específica en el pago eh, que estamos haciendo eh, a los productores por su cacao especial o su cacao que es fino de aroma como tal. Bueno, aquí están, esto pues también lo pueden observar en nuestra página de internet, pues se puede descargar este reporte de transparencia eh, y ahí pueden de, establecer las diferencias de, lo que, de los diferentes precios eh, que existen para los diferentes orígenes que, en los cuales estamos trabajando y la, el volumen comprado por año por un común cacao y los precios pagados en cada uno de los, de los eslabones o los, los diferentes pasos de la cadena eh, productiva de, de cacao. Bueno, esto es también buscar algo muy, muy visual, muy atractivo, algo que... Eh, para un consumidor o alguien que está comprometido y consciente de un buen cacao y que sea un cacao bien pagado, buscamos mostrar en una cartilla como esta o en una, en una slide como este toda la información posible. Entonces ustedes podrán ver por acá lo que es eh, el, 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 el tema de calidad. Aquí está el tema del protocolo de fermentación y secado, el tipo de bolsas que se utiliza, el tipo genético y si está certificado orgánico para Estados Unidos en este caso o para Europa. Y aquí está la calidad del grano como tal, donde podemos ver que es calidad, calidad ultra premium, que ha ganado en este caso el, el cacao de Maya Mountain, la región sur de Belice, ha ganado pues, 58 premios en total y también tiene en el 2018 22 y algunas notas del sabor, en este caso pues es eh, un poco de pasas, eh, miel y piña. Eh, el, también el precio de un common versus el precio tradicional de commodity en el mercado y la diferencia en porcentaje, que estamos por encima de esos precios, de precio internacional, también tenemos una información de impacto social, es la cantidad de personas, o granjeros o productores registrados, cuántas de ellas o de ellos son mujeres activos o miembros participantes activos. También tenemos el promedio de ventas por eh, productor que ha sido vendido en seco eh, y está también el promedio anual de ingreso por productor eh, por su cacao. 
y algunos eh, recursos en cuanto a, a, a lo que obtiene el, o obtiene el productor, que son capacitaciones en eh, agricultura orgánica y prevención y de, de monilia y de, de otro. Y también todo el tema de ambiente, su cuidado y su restauración, por acá lo pueden ver ustedes presentes. Entonces, si se dan cuenta, tratamos de mostrar en un reporte, no solo trazabilidad, eh, muchas veces se confunde la palabra transparencia, y, y se asigna o se entiende directamente como trazabilidad, o también a veces la transparencia se confunde con simples fotos que se le toma a la gente, y es más que eso, eh, ser transparente es llevar un mensaje desde el inicio de la cadena o la base importante que, que tiene la misma, hasta el último de la cadena, y llevar un mensaje claro, directo y honesto en cuestión de precio, en cuestiones sociales, cuestiones económicas y cuestiones culturales, eso es lo que busca un reporte de transparencia, este caso es uno de Colombia, de Tumaco. Eh, algunos retos que normalmente también nosotros tenemos es que la gente se debe educar o que la gente debe aprender, cuando digo la gente son los consumidores de países como Europa o países como Estados Unidos y Canadá, que las diferencias que hay en un producto o en un cacao con comercio transparente y un cacao que puede tener un certificado de comercio justo. Lamentablemente, y comparto muchas de las opiniones o palabras de, de Carla, a veces no hay un ente que rija eh, o que establezca qué transparente puede ser una empresa o cómo regir la transparencia de, en cuanto a las empresas productoras de granos de cacao en este caso porque no hay tampoco un sello específico de, de, de transparencia como lo hay en fair trade o como lo hay en, en, en producción orgánica y pues sería muy muy bueno empezar esa charla o esa discusión para establecer ese observatorio para establecer ese ente que regule el tema de transparencia y que también lo respalde y lo certifique como tal porque eh, a veces pierde cierto sentido o importancia comparado con otros certificados y a veces el, eh, el comercio transparente, para mí personalmente, puede tener una mayor importancia que el mismo comercio justo, porque si se dan cuenta acá hay comercio justo, hay producción orgánica, hay respeto por la vida, respeto por la naturaleza en un solo eh, respaldo que es la transparencia. Eh, para comentarles, en Guatemala nosotros tenemos 23 grupos de pueblos o pueblos indígenas descendientes de los mayas y dentro de los reportes de transparencia también mostramos esos contextos. Aunque a ustedes no lo vieron por acá, pues eso pues eh, lo, lo veamos ahora por cuestión de, de tiempo o espacio, pero en los reportes que pueden descargar desde la web pueden encontrar también los contextos. ¿Por qué es importante un contexto? Porque si bien es cierto, son granos de cacao los que se producen en eh, Colombia y son granos de cacao los que se producen en Guatemala o en Belice o en Haití, cada uno tiene su contexto diferente o su contexto, su, su contexto donde se produce. Uno se produce en territorios donde se habla un idioma maya o un idioma indígena y llegar a estos territorios, capacitarlos, brindar asistencia técnica, se convierte en un reto mayor porque no podemos romper con su cultura y se debe saber también el idioma y respetar esas costumbres y tradiciones. Entonces, eh, al participar en, este, en espacios o en territorios, como lo vienen, se viene mencionando, es importante conocer el mismo, no solo en términos de clima, de suelo, sino también en términos sociales y culturales y eso también mostrárselo al consumidor para que vean las condiciones culturales de un entorno que es muy importante y no solo las condiciones climáticas o condiciones de producción propias de cacao. Entonces creo que los reportes de transparencia en algún momento tendrán que llevar más esa parte cultural, social de los pueblos o los territorios donde se produce para crear conciencia también del de respeto hacia la vida, el respeto hacia la naturaleza y el ambiente en los mismos. Esos son algunos de los, de los, de los retos. Bueno, eh, ya para ir terminando, eh, mucho se compara el, el tema de, 
de, de cacao de África con el cacao de Latinoamérica. Lamentablemente, pues hay unas condiciones más eh, eh, pues, negativas para, para un sector que para el otro. Normalmente el cacao de, de, de África pues, se asocia a situaciones adversas desde lo social eh, y ambiental, mientras que en Latinoamérica eh, comúnmente se dice que, que, que es, son un poquito menos o son menos los problemas eh, sociales o, o las cuestiones negativas. Sin embargo, sí es importante eh, comentarles que el ingreso se, de un cacao de comercio transparente es mucho mayor definitivamente que un, un comercio convencional o sin transparencia. Y, y esto puede ser aplicado en Latinoamérica, puede ser aplicado en África sin ningún problema. Todo es cuestión de conciencia y de voluntad de las empresas quienes están en las cadenas de valor de cacao, de los consumidores. Y creo que lo que falta mucho en, en muchos sectores, sobre todo en los consumidores, es educación. Educarse y entender el porqué de los precios, el porqué de las calidades el sabor y el aroma del cacao. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much to Roy for joining us. So you've now heard from an academic thinking about transparency in uh, abstract terms, and you've also heard from someone who's daily engaged in collecting data, contextualizing data, and understanding transparency more broadly for this transparency report, which for the record, when it comes to uncommon cacao, this is uncommon cacao, this is one of the most detailed transparency reports available on the market and provides more information than really any other similar operation does today. So there's a lot to think about already. Now, we also wanted to hear from someone working with chocolate and to think about what it meant to them to engage with transparency. And we're very fortunate that here in France, there is a chocolate maker focused deeply on transparency, on direct relationships with producers, on quality in both cacao and chocolate. And it's an honor to introduce Hasna Ferreira of Hasna Chocolat Grand Cru, who has traveled here today from the Bordeaux region to speak with us about what transparency means to her and to her business. Welcome. <laughs> Bonjour, désolée je vais parler français, je suis un peu plus à l'aise en français. Euh, ben je suis ravie de partager ce moment avec vous et pouvoir témoigner un peu de mon expérience en tant que chocolatier. Euh, J'ai commencé ce métier il y a six ans. C'est vrai qu'il y a six ans on m'aurait dit tu serais chocolatier, tu fabriquerais à partir de la fève, je ne l'aurais pas cru. Et je vais commencer d'abord par un premier manque de transparence déjà dans ce métier. Comme ça, ça va vous indiquer pourquoi j'ai choisi ce chemin et cette façon de faire. Avant, j'étais une simple consommatrice de chocolat. Donc j'étais folle de chocolat et c'est d'ailleurs pour ça que j'ai choisi ce métier. Et je pensais que tous les chocolatiers fabriquaient à partir de la fève. Il y a pas mal de gens qui pensent comme moi. Enfin, qui pensent encore comme je pensais. Puisque une fois que je me suis formée, parce qu'ici à l'école on apprend à faire du chocolat, euh, faire des ganaches, des pralinés, mais pas à travailler à partir de la fève. C'est un savoir-faire qu'il faut aller vraiment chercher plus loin. Il y a un peu disparu en France. Donc la plupart des chocolatiers en France sont des fondeurs de chocolat, ne sont pas des fabricants de chocolat. Voilà le premier flou auquel je me suis confrontée en France. Et là je me suis dit, bon, qu'est-ce qu'on fait J'attends qu'on m'apprenne ou euh, je cherche le savoir ailleurs. J'ai fait les deux. J'ai attendu et ensuite j'ai cherché. J'ai d'abord travaillé comme tous les chocolatiers, donc j'ai commencé à faire fondre du chocolat, à faire des choses classiques, les ganaches, les pralinés, les tablettes. Et ensuite, euh, le destin a mis quelqu'un sur mon chemin pour m'apprendre à travailler à partir de la fève. Et là, tout un champ des possibles qui se présente, c'est génial, tout ce qu'on peut produire, parce que ça ne ressemble pas à ce qu'on peut trouver ailleurs. Justement, c'est là où on retrouve sa vraie personnalité. Donc, euh, il ne s'agit pas juste de rajouter des épices dans quelque chose pour dire, voilà, je fais un chocolat différent. Non, j'ai enfin l'occasion, mille fois l'occasion, de rater et d'abîmer des fèves, et une fois pour bien les réussir. Donc, justement, donc, je me retrouve face à cette situation, de me dire, euh, voilà, je me forme, 
à travailler à partir de la fève. Donc on a rencontré une personne, mon époux et moi, qui travaille avec moi, Vincent Ferreira, qui n'a pas pu être là malheureusement, et on s'est formé. Et quand on s'est formé, on a regardé qu'il y avait quand même encore du flou. Là, non seulement quand il s'agit de travailler du chocolat, mais un flou dans la, dans la communication, dans les origines, dans le parcellaire, dans le terroir, comme on a dit, on peut l'appeler parcellaire, terroir. Mais à côté de ça, j'ai eu la chance, et j'ai la chance de vivre à Bordeaux, et de profiter du langage un peu du vin. Et je me suis dit, mais pourquoi est-ce que le cacao ne bénéficie pas de cette même aura, en quelque sorte Est-ce que c'est parce que c'est encore considéré comme une simple confiserie, ou est-ce que c'est parce que ça ne pousse pas ici, ou est-ce que c'est parce qu'on ne on peut pas être ivre avec Je ne sais pas. Et il y a plein de raisons. Et là, je me suis dit, bah, on peut faire sortir le chocolat quand même un peu, et lui donner un peu sa lettre de noblesse, un peu comme le vin. J'ai utilisé ce, ce langage de communication à Bordeaux pour que les gens puissent réaliser que c'est la même chose, qu'il y a une notion de, de, de profil aromatique complètement différente. Et voilà, ça a commencé comme ça. Donc revenons un peu sur la transparence. Quand je parle à mes clients, ils me disent, ils ne savent pas d'où ça vient. Ils commencent tous par une phrase, par exemple, « Oui, par exemple, tous les chocolats de Colombie sont forts, ou le chocolat de Madagascar, il a des notes ceci, des notes acidulées. » Et donc, la généralisation. Tous ces éléments, toutes ces questions viennent parce qu'il y a un manque de transparence. Et en cherchant avec qui je vais pouvoir travailler pour pouvoir travailler directement des fèves, on a la chance, effectivement, de tomber sur Uncommon Cacao. On est client de Uncommon Cacao. Et ça, ça nous enlève une grande épine du pied. Parce que moi, en tant que petit artisan, je n'ai pas la possibilité d'aller moi-même tout le temps vérifier pour pouvoir retranscrire ce qui se passe ailleurs et le dire à mon client à la fin. Parce que j'y tiens. Parce que je me mets à la place de ces clients, puisque j'y étais il y a six ans. Je voulais que les choses soient claires. Et donc j'ai un intermédiaire qui me permet d'avoir cette information, qui me facilite le travail. Et ça, c'est précieux. Parce que je, grâce à ça, déjà, j'ai la conscience tranquille. Et en plus... Ça me permet de bien communiquer auprès de mon client et de l'éduquer, justement, pour qu'il comprenne pourquoi ce chocolat a ce goût. Pourquoi, effectivement, le chocolat du Pérou, ils euh, ben, ne sont pas tous pareils Ou pourquoi il a ce prix Pourquoi on le vend à ce prix-là Parce que j'ai eu un jour quelqu'un qui m'a dit « Eh oui, pourquoi c'est plus cher que l'int ?»« Eh oui, je peux vous expliquer pourquoi c'est plus cher et vous allez comprendre. Est-ce que vous avez cinq minutes ?» Et donc là, notre travail, ce n'est pas que de fabriquer du chocolat, on est la liaison entre le client, le fabricant, enfin l'organisme qui lui nous envoie et lui aide euh, à former les producteurs au traitement post-récolte. On a ce devoir, nous aussi, de transparence. On a ce devoir de quête de transparence. C'est très, très important. Et c'est, j'ai remarqué une chose, juste pour vous dire, sans que ce soit ça mon but premier, une fois que j'ai traversé l'autre côté, j'ai vendu quatre fois plus de tablettes. Les gens sont contents quand on est transparent avec eux. On dit la vérité et puis c'est comme ça. Et ils acceptent et voilà, ils comprennent et ça se passe très très bien comme ça. Donc, en tout cas, moi je suis ravie d'avoir choisi cette direction, même si elle est un peu plus difficile, parce que, comme je vous ai dit, j'ai mille fois la possibilité de, de louper une production, parce qu'il n'y a pas vraiment d'école, c'est la sensation, c'est un peu... Voilà, j'ai reçu ces fèves-là, j'essaie de les lire, j'essaie de voir la fermentation, quel temps de, de température je vais donner, enfin, le temps ou plutôt euh, la durée pour la torréfaction, je vais donner pour qu'il donne le mieux de ses arômes, donc essayer de respecter tous ces éléments-là. Mais à côté de ça, euh, comme je vous ai dit, j'ai vraiment mille fois l'occasion de louper tout ça. Et le client, à la fin, euh, et, il est content. Bon, en tout cas, mes clients à Bordeaux, ils ont compris, ça ne va pas plaire à tout le monde, mais ce qui leur plaît, c'est la transparence. Après, à côté de tout ça, les... on ne peut pas avoir tous les pays. Malheureusement, pour le moment, je n'ai pas tous les pays. J'aimerais bien que ce soit généralisé partout. En tant que petit artisan, j'aimerais bien que tous les autres artisans aient aussi la même euh, approche. Ça faciliterait énormément de choses pour tout le monde, pour les clients. Et surtout, surtout, comme je dis, quand on paye au bon prix, franchement, des fois, il ne faut même plus se soucier de la qualité. Je pense que tout suit par la suite. Tout vient naturellement, parce que je pense qu'il y a une notion de justice très très importante là-dedans, et je n'aurais pas la conscience tranquille, je ne dormirais pas bien si jamais j'achetais des fèves euh, déjà pas de bonne qualité, ou alors 
pas de très bon euh, prix ou correct, ça ne serait vraiment pas juste pour les gens qui travaillent dans les plantations. Je vous donne juste un exemple pour que je puisse réaliser cette notion de justice. Je suis partie dans les plantations, je me suis dit je veux vraiment voir ce qui se fait là-bas pour pouvoir bien en parler, et j'ai insisté pour pouvoir porter un sac plein de cabosses. J'ai même pas pu faire 10 mètres avec, tellement c'était lourd et dur dans la chaleur, l'humidité, tous les chocolatiers doivent passer par là pour pouvoir le savoir et pouvoir en parler. On est sous la lumière, on est un peu les stars. Moi, je dis, je n'ai pas trouvé le virus d'Ebola, je fais que du chocolat. Mais à côté de ça, ceux qui devraient avoir de la lumière, c'est vraiment les gens qui travaillent dans les plantations, parce que c'est eux qui ont le travail le plus dur. Si... <rire> Il y a un autre proverbe que j'aime bien, qui n'est peut-être pas très conventionnel. Je dis, très bien, on ne fait pas d'un âne un cheval de course. Par exemple, si on me donne des fèves qui ne sont pas de très bonne qualité... Effectivement, je ne vais pas faire des miracles à part tricher, mettre de la vanille, mettre des, des choses farfelues pour rendre un peu maquiller le chocolat ou rajouter du café ou je ne sais quoi. En revanche, si on me donne un cheval de course, je peux lui casser les pieds. Donc c'est à mon niveau que je peux faire les plus grandes erreurs si jamais je ne choisis pas bien. Mais en tout cas, c'est à leur niveau qu'ils font déjà le plus gros boulot. C'est un travail vraiment main dans la main avec eux. Et comme je n'ai pas cette possibilité d'aller visiter tous les pays, c'est sur ce genre d'organisme qu'il faut compter parce que eux, ils, font, ils ont le savoir scientifique, géographique, politique. Je trouve qu'ils gèrent mieux pour nous. Et un chocolatier qui vous dit bah, « Moi, je vais voir partout, je fais tout, je choisis tout moi-même. Bah, » Je ne sais pas quand est-ce qu'il a le temps de faire du chocolat. Voilà pour moi. Merci, Hasna. And so I hope this gives you a sense of, of why transparency might be supportive of consumer relationships, of the work of a small and uh, newer chocolate maker. And it, I think it's important that we're having this conversation here in Europe, which is in many ways the, the site of the development of the chocolate industry more broadly, and which is not historically known anyway for transparency. If I can pick on, on the United States a little bit, our own uh, Franklin Mars, the developer of M&Ms and the Mars Bar, the way that he learned to make chocolate was by coming incognito under a pseudonym and hiding and working without anyone's knowledge in a Swiss chocolate company to learn everything that they did and steal their secrets. So this is the industry heritage that we operate on, and this is an entirely different approach to sourcing, to manufacturing, where transparency is paramount as opposed to the opposite. Okay. Next, I would like to welcome Jeff Steinberg of Latitude Trade Company, based in Uganda. And it was very important for us to, given the underrepresentation of Africa in general, to invite someone who's working first in the African continent, but is also trying to, through transparency, through quality, and through the, the skill of his work overall, make a, a non-traditional origin become a more popular one. And so Jeff is going to share with us about some of the challenges and successes that he faces in his work. Please welcome Jeff Steinberg. Hello. Hello. Um, as she said, I'm Jeff. Uh, from originally from the U.S. I'm not traditionally African, but uh, I've been living in Africa for a while, um, and more specifically in Uganda for the past three or four years. Uh, so yeah, as she said, I'll talk about um, our experience so far in Uganda, um, starting Latitude and, and working with the farmers there, and then as well kind of about you know, how we deal with the transparency issue and, and, and try to promote that in our, in our operations and in our company vision. Um, so uh, Latitude is a social enterprise in Uganda, uh, uh, founded in 2017 uh, by myself, um, and the, the real uh, you know, the bottom line of this is that we source cacao from small farmers there. Uh, we export um, and we do a small amount of chocolate production in the capital city. Um, and so, in theory, vertically integrated. Um, uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, just so we're all on the same page, Uganda, kind of in the center there, basically East Africa, but we are uh, where that star is, which is a town called Buni Bujo. Um, and that's where our, our fermentary, our cacao sourcing and fermentary is. And then in Kampala is where, where our chocolate factory is. 
um, and where the majority of, of uh, products travel through. Um, Uganda, in general, uh, is not a big name in the cacao industry. Uh, there's maybe 20 or 30,000 tons exported, some of that from Congo, uh, who really knows. Uh, but the majority of the cacao comes from this small district there, which is just on the border region um, with uh, the Congo. Um, and so, yeah, majority, about 70% of the cacao in Uganda comes from one small district, uh, all grown by smallholder farmers. Um, and so basically, you know, our mission, my background is mainly in uh, economics, impact evaluation and development. And so I come at cacao mainly from a uh, kind of economic impact uh, lens. And so, you know, our, our company is mainly founded on this mission of, you know, how can we sustainably increase incomes for farmers, reduce the risk, provide some stability, and, um, and yeah, push others to do better. Um, and so the opportunity, you know, in Uganda and cacao that we saw is actually, this was just taken a couple weeks ago, uh, but mainly um, the quality in, in Uganda was, was quite poor when we first started. Um, people in this room may have even stopped using it because it had stones in it or, or whatnot. Um, it's a rainy season harvest, so that means that the majority of smallholder farmers who are, you know, on one or two dollars a day, uh, you know, are harvesting cacao with their ha household labor, and they're spending one or two weeks trying to just get it dry. It is skipping the whole fermentation thing. It happens a bit incidentally because we're bringing it in and, in and out of the house, and it end up, ends up looking a little bit like what we call fluorescent cacao, uh, just bright green mold. Um, and so, you know, in addition to that, you know, part of the outcome and part of the, the cycle of it is the price that farmers are getting. It's low, it's variable, um, and our kind of thesis and, you know, general theory of change is that, you know, a lot of the things that we see in the cacao industry, you know, in Africa in general, uh, in Uganda, um, specifically in our region, there's issues with food security and, you know, child uh, school attendance, just because it costs money to send a child to school. Um, but all these are kind of, you know, secondary impacts of the income that households are or are not getting. Um, and in a place where it's completely covered with cacao, um, yeah, money and income from cacao means everything. Um, uh, the, other, the other issues that we kind of see in school tennis is up there twice because it's very important, um, is uh, thefts and losses um, because of this extended drying period that farmers uh, experience. So they could be trying to dry their cacao for, for two weeks. It's a crowded place um, and yeah, mold and theft uh, is, is quite uh, common. Um, and so that's kind of the, the background for where we got started in cacao and, and, and um, what we wanted to do. Really, they're comically simple, our goals. Um, we mainly want to offer a better option for farmers. Um, and so we're not telling farmers, of course, we have contracted farmers that we work with, uh, but the reality is that they're small businesses and they should operate with, with a set of options and a set of customers. Um, and so first and foremost, we want to we offer a great option. Um, we want to buy a lot of co cocoa at a sustainable and premium price um, and just as much as possible because, you know, uh, the farmers there are producing and, um, you know, the alternatives in terms of the price that they get are not, not great. Um, we want to operate with transparency, traceability and sustainability. We'll come to that. Um, we want to utilize our network for, uh, and rural infrastructure for good. So, uh, you know, underlying our cacao sourcing and um, and operations, you know, offers a, a unique set of opportunities to, to interact with rural households. And so, you know, we want to think about, okay, we're buying cacao, but how can we also support food security or um, microloans or health products or things like that? And lastly, and most importantly, um, you know, as a company, we don't intend to buy all the cocoa in Uganda, not even necessarily the majority of it. Um, but, you know, the goal of what what we try and do and what a lot of folks in the specialty industry want to do is to, to try and exert pressure and to try and, and build a case for how these sorts of things can work. Traceable supply chains, full transparency, premium prices, um, to try and, and, yeah, move people uh, in the right direction. So that's kind of what we see, uh, you know, ourselves doing in Uganda and in the region in general. Uh, so, yeah, just a bit of a summary. Uh, suppliers, basically a thousand organic certified smallholder farmers uh, in western Uganda. Uh, smallholder meaning half an acre up to five acres. Um, 
you know, quite uh, old trees that were planted, you know, a long time ago by, by government programs. And the majority of these farmers are on uh, what the West or the Northern world would call, traditionally call poverty level wages. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the income that they get from cacao is, is quite important. There's not a lot of land space for growing even food, um, uh, just because it's a quite geographically uh, tight region. Uh, and so most of these farmers take their money that they get from their, their cocoa and they go out directly and buy food that's been imported from another region, um, which is a pretty significant challenge. Um, and so we offer, we offer the farmers uh, training on organic practices and agronomy and, uh, and now as well, kind of the second part of our theory of change, okay, we're going to pay a higher price, but also like what happens then with that money? Does it generate some value for the household, for the business? Um, and so we started as well training on financial literacy and farm business management along with some of our partners in the Netherlands. Um, uh, cacao for us is collected uh, fresh at rural collection points. Um, so basically we'll go out weekly um, with field officers, with you know, people from our company and set up essentially just roadside collection points uh, where farmers know to find us. And um, there we uh, basically set up a, a, a weighing scale, a bag of cash and a list of the contracted organic farmers and we pay cash on delivery. And, um, all the farmers, the, the price is, is publicly advertised, so everybody knows the price, um, and it's near the farms. So, uh, you know, on top of the premium price that we pay, which is about equivalent to about uh, $2.30 uh, per kilo, um, you know, farmers are not experiencing transport costs. There's no household labor involved in the processing of cacao because we buy it immediately when they harvest it. Um, there's no uh, losses in spoilage you know, go straight from the farm, um, and there's minimal theft, um, just because there's not much time for, for, for people to steal cacao. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's a, I underline the cash on delivery, it's a quite important thing in sourcing in, in Africa, it's not all that common. Um, mainly in most of these industries, uh, in Uganda in particular, and uh, Tanzania, Zambia, uh, a trader or an exporter will buy cacao and then maybe one or two weeks later you'll come and collect your cash uh, if you're the farmer. Um, and so it's a, it's a bit of a risky thing that we do, but uh, it's, it's impactful and, and, it's, and it's valued. Um, and the other thing as well on that note, small things like weighing scales um, are another, you know, uh, challenge in, in sort of uh, sourcing in, you know, uh, rural Africa, which is just, um, you know, getting people um, to have confidence in the methods of weighing and the methods of, of your collection, um, which is turned out to be much more important than we realized. Having a sticker on there saying this is certified by the Ugandan government apparently makes you, um, you know, a, 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 a place of first delivery. Um, and I know friends in Tanzania have had similar experiences. Um, and then we centrally process the cacao. So the same day that we collect it, um, we transport it back to our main facility, which is less than 10 kilometers from the farms. Um, and we box ferment there. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, cacao processing, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty intensive six to seven day process that we do there with, you know, a lot of monitoring and tracking. Um, and, and then we uh, dry in these, uh, solar dryers that we, we kind of designed and developed, which helps us through the rainy season. Um, and so, you know, throughout that entire process, from the time that a farmer delivers cacao to our collection point, all the way through the production process, there's basically full traceability. So um, every kilo is, is accounted for um, in terms of knowing which farm it's come from. Um, yeah. Um, and then lastly, uh, we as well do chocolate in Uganda. And so the, the biggest um, sort of reason for this and reason for starting it on, on our side was to understand cacao quality. Um, I think as Carla alluded to and as many have, there's not a tremendous amount of consensus out there and understanding about what is quality cacao, particularly when you're getting started and you know, farmers have been dealing with uh, traders and exporters who, who don't care as much. Um, and so we started just making chocolate ourselves to, to figure out you know, what it means and, and what some of our customers will be going through. Um, and so that's been a, a huge um, uh, value for us 
you know, from the beginning and as well throughout the development of the company, um, just because it allows us a very quick feedback loop in terms of what we're doing um, in, on the farms and as well at the center for mentoring. Um, and so we know within a week whether something has worked out or not or what needs to be changed more. And so uh, the, the basic story behind the chocolate is that we put some sugar in, made a two ingredient chocolate and uh, surprisingly desperate expats in Uganda loved it. Um, there's not a lot of options there. Um, so, so we, and, it, and it also creates a good opportunity for us to engage with farmers and, and help them understand what all of these you know, contracts and, and um, guidelines that we have around their harvesting and around their agronomy, what those mean. And they can, we can give them a chocolate bar that is made out of great beans and one that is made out of very poor beans and they can understand then you know, exactly why it's important to do the things that we're asking them to do. Um, and, and as well, it's an exciting thing, you know, as, um, as someone alluded to, uh, there's a lot of pride that, that people have over these products that they're, you know, putting a lot of work into. And so when you can give them a finished bar or uh, a disc or just anything that shows them, okay, this is what's coming from my product, it, it means a lot um, and it creates a, a better relationship uh, for everybody. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of on the challenges of starting a specialty operation because it's a, um, we get contacted a lot about it and I know it's a, it's a big buzz thing in the industry. Um, it seems quite simple. Uh, make great cacao, charge a lot of money for it, um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, tell a story. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a challenge over the previous couple of years for us. Um, and you know, there's general market entry for a new product or a new producer those challenges I think happen with starting any business. Um, but also, yeah, just, uh, you know, an understanding around what quality is and what the target is um, and, and sort of getting, you know, up to speed um, from a producer and a, and a processor standpoint in terms of what quality cacao looks like, um, which is a huge hurdle. Uh, price discovery, and I think this, you know, is, is pretty spot on for the transparency issue, but just understanding, you know, from the basic farmer level, what it costs to produce the cacao, from a processor level, you know, what market there is for that cacao, and then, you know, just generally what, what the willingness to pay is for, for certain origins and certain beans. Um, is oftentimes for, for people at origin, it's a huge black box. Um, you don't really know what, you know what you've spent to get it, and you don't really know what somebody else is willing to pay for it, and that's just the nature of, of, of the beast. Um, and then the, the last couple of things are, are you know, uh, just around general, uh, you know, size of customers and market size and things like that. Um, you know, the, the specialty industry is quite, uh, is quite small. And so it means that there are just natural realities of how much cacao one can move and sell um, to, to chocolate makers and chocolatiers who are buying one, two tons um, is, is a very, you know, solid bean to bar operation. <laughs> Um, and so that's, that's a challenge, especially for us. I mean, we have, we have farmers who, who want to produce more and who want to sell more because it's a good opportunity for them. Um, brings me to the next point, the scalability and the intensiveness of the, this kind of processing um, is also a challenge. Um, it takes up a lot of space. It requires a lot of, uh, you know, on the ground management, understanding of what you're tracking and, and, and why. Um, and yeah, that's a huge challenge. And then lastly is just the number of origins that are coming up in general. Um, I think I'm sure Un Uncommon would tell you how many samples they get um, you know, per week. It's, there's a lot of people who are interested in the concept of it. Um, and there's a bit of a balancing act that kind of needs to happen in terms of the demand and the number of people who can uh, buy specialty quality um, and at specialty prices vis-a-vis -vis the number of folks trying to produce. Um, and and so lastly, for, for us, kind of just a, a nuts and bolts of like what transparency means. Um, and this goes both ways in terms of how we deal with the suppliers and also how we deal with our customers, chocolate makers um, in the US, Europe, uh, and Asia. Um, and first and foremost is price, just communicating both on both sides. Like this is what we're paying, this is why we're paying it, um, and this is how much we're charging um, for the cacao that we're exporting. Um, uh, organizationally, just um, on both sides again, like having folks understand, you know, who is doing what and under what terms. That goes from employees to people sourcing the cacao to contractors along the way that help you 
get your product to port or to another country. Um, standards and practices, a lot of this has to do with just kind of norms around the interactions between ourselves and the farmers or ourselves and the buyers. Um, so I think the, scale, the weighing scale is a great thing. Farmers know that when they come to our place, if they don't see the sticker, then they have all license to call me on my cell phone or, you know, just to, to, to raise the issue with that because, um, you know, it should be there. Um, expectations is a big one, and this is one that, you know, that we've always had challenges with. Um, and part of the reason for highlighting the initial points about the challenges. Uh, just because, you know, coming into my background is, is a lot in, uh, you know, bigger commodity sourcing. And so, you know, coming into the specialty industry, we thought we would be doing 500, 1,000 tons within a couple of years. Um, and so, and farmers don't, uh, you know, see why that's also not possible. Um, and so just setting those expectations with folks on both sides, um, you know, at the farm level about what you can offer and on what terms um, is hugely important. Um, challenges, just being honest about, um, you know, what's not working or, or what the issues are. Um, and then lastly is, yeah, traceability is, is pretty, pretty apparent and an easy one. Uh, but basically documenting everything that goes on from start to finish. Um, and it seems, yeah, it's soundbite quite uh, simple, but um, it can be a real pain. Um, and so uh, the challenges that we have, um, and I think that are worth highlighting um, around transparency, uh, first and foremost, trust and power, um, and particularly coming from origin, coming from you know, a smaller company or you know, having worked with uh, cooperatives and traders and things like that, um, trust is a big thing, um, and the power dynamics that exist between a buyer and a producer. And mainly, I think the thing to refer to here is the kind of concept that, um, uh, you know, if I tell you what I'm paying somebody, what I paid for this product, or if I reveal my source to you, you will find a way to squeeze me out, or you'll find a way to, 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 to get the price down, or to take my place, or something like that. Um, and so it's, you know, it's easy for us to, to throw up our prices when we have, uh, you know, relationships with our customers, um, you know, that provide value uh, in other ways. But when you're a farmer, when you're a cooperative, when you're a producer, or even many traders and exporters in these countries, it's not as easy to, to sort of give up that information. Um, the next thing is intellectual property, which uh, we were just having a conversation uh, at lunch about. But just the concept that, you know, in any of these operations, even in chocolate companies, right, like a lot of effort and work goes into figuring out how to do certain things. And money and energy and time has been spent on that. And so it's a kind of delicate line to walk when you're trying to, to reveal to somebody, this is everything, this is how we do something. Um, and just being able to have that security or that um, trust with the individual that, you know, I'm revealing, you know, some, some secrets or some hard-earned uh, knowledge um, that benefits us both and that won't be used against, won't be used against the company. Uh, paperwork and logistics is a huge part of traceability that is, is a real challenge. Um, and as I think, you know, a, a sizable amount of, of the work that that's, uh, goes into things like certification and this uncommon transparency report. Um, yeah, it is what it is. It's, it's just quite tough. Um, and then the last couple of things I think are just challenges and questions that, you know, we ask and that, you know, uh, you know we talk to our partners about, which is, um, you know, what should go into cacao pricing? And I think excellent that Carla had put up that slide as well, because um, this is a question that we often ask as well. Um, there are many things that you can value. There are many things that it's quite difficult to assign a dollar value to. Um, and then the last is just why. I mean, what is the point to do it? Um, and I, th I think that's a, <laughs> not to, not to, you know, stoke too much conversation, but I think it's an important question to ask. And, uh, you know, just speaking from our perspective at Latitude, I mean, the, the main reason to do it is, is to, to try and push, to try and push people around and try to get, um, you know, ultimately we're talking, in Uganda we're talking about other people buying cacao, we're talking about people buying cacao in Tanzania, um, their customers, things like that, but the end goal kind of in many cases lands with the consumer. And so just trying to make them ask these questions about, you know, 
where do you get your cacao from and how much do you pay for it? And the more that consumers start asking that question, the hope is the more that people and uh, bigger companies uh, will respond to it um, and develop a strategy around it. Um, so yeah, I think that's mainly it. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite all of our panelists to come up here. And while they do, could we please give a round of applause for the translators? <laughs> so we, we have a trilingual panel here. We're working in three different languages, which is exciting, but also challenging. OK. Ah, perfect. <laughs> so I have two main questions that I would like to ask before we open for the audience. And the first one is, have you ever encountered any negative feedback in relation to a focus on transparency? If so, what was it? And why do you think it happened? Por favor. Bueno, buenas tardes nuevamente. Eh, algunas de situaciones eh, o comentarios negativos que, que hemos recibido, eh, más que ser negativos, podrían ser sugerencias, considero, eh, donde se incorporen registros de costos. Eh, normalmente los productores del área latinoamericana o productores de cacao a nivel del mundo eh, no tienen una cultura o una costumbre de registrar los costos de producción de cada una de sus actividades tanto en cosecha, poda, desige o eh, pues, poda de la sombra, fertilización, no hay esa, esa cultura de registro eh, escrito o un registro por computadora o un registro por cualquier dispositivo y que esté disponible en tiempo real. Entonces, eh, muchos de los consumidores y muchas de las personas que de los chocolateros que buscan un, un cacao transparente sugieren que vaya o que se incluya el tema de, de costos de producción del productor específicamente desde que siembra la semilla hasta que obtiene el, la mazorca de, de cacao y esa es una de las eh, esa sugerencia es una de las incorporaciones que este año ya tuvimos eh, dentro del para el reporte de transparencia del siguiente año pues se va a ver reflejado hemos realizado un análisis de costos eh, junto con Acumen, que eh, nos ha apoyado durante una semana en Guatemala para recoger información directo de los productores con grupos focales para obtener la información clara, directa y honesta de cuánto le cuesta producir un kilo de cacao y si el pago que está recibiendo actualmente compensa ese costo o tiene un ingreso o un, un beneficio o un, prof, un profit como tal uh, de, de esa actividad. Muchas gracias. Alors, euh, évidemment, pour moi, c'est une autre position. Hein. Je ne suis pas dans la même place. Par contre, j'ai eu deux points de vue différents. De la part du client, euh, je vais parler de, de cette expérience en premier, les clients sont très demandeurs de transparence. Au contraire, c'est que positif. Ils nous encouragent à continuer dans ce sens et, et en plus, euh, ils font même de la publicité d'eux-mêmes. Euh, ça en est même gênant des fois. Ben, je ne fais pas ça pour ça à la base. Il euh, y a un autre point de vue. Les autres acteurs dans le milieu du chocolat qui ne partagent pas cette vision disent que c'est du pur marketing. Alors moi, je les laisserai dire parce que je connais mes motivations puisque de toute façon, je sais pourquoi je le fais. Je fais ça parce que dès le départ, quand j'étais cliente, je trouvais que ça manquait. Donc je ne vais pas euh, effectivement suivre le mauvais chemin, puisque maintenant, je, je fais ce métier. Je veux justement montrer qu'on peut faire autre chose, euh, et quelque chose qui est juste et honnête. Parce qu'au-delà de la transparence, il faut être honnête. Voilà. Oui, merci beaucoup. Uh, not a tremendous amount to add, but I guess just one point that I think is important to make is about um, nuance in particular. So I don't, I don't get complaints. Farmers are pretty happy. Uh, chocolate makers are pretty happy that we're just revealing, uh, you know, uh, much about our operation. But I think, uh, you know, uh, the transparency in and of itself is not necessarily uh, just useful by itself. Um, it needs context. It needs nuance to understand, you know, exactly what 
what's going on and why, you know, in the transparency report, there's this price for cacao on the farm gate and it's different here and the prices are the same at the end and these sorts of things. Um, yeah, it's just a general kind of warning and, and, and uh, uh, concept that I think is important. Thank you. Now, another thing that we've uncovered in our research, which is perhaps not surprising to all of you, is that many companies will engage in transparency or publish a transparency report, but they find that very few of their customers will read that report or engage with it in any sort of profound way. And in fact, in some of the interviews that we did, people said, you know, we can see how many downloads were done of our report, and it's three or <laughs> 10. And they think, you know, we spent six months, a year, more collecting this data. Uh, what's the purpose if we're communicating to an audience that's not listening? And I'm curious, have you had similar experiences? And if so, why do you continue to engage in transparency? I've not necessarily had similar experiences, but I guess my response would mainly be, um, yeah, just about general communications. I think a lot of chocolate companies and chocolatiers are uh, experts or becoming experts in packaging and communication and things like that. So my response would be, well, you know, I personally don't necessarily want to comb through 20 pages of a PDF uh, transparency report, uh, so let's find an innovative and unique way of packaging this. I think Raka is a great example. You open a chocolate bar and on the inside, much of what you've seen in the uncommon transparency report is sitting right there uh, looking you in the eye and it's a little bit difficult to avoid. So I think, you know, building on the last comment, obviously there's a bit of nuance there. It's missed when it's on the inside of a 50 gram chocolate bar, uh, but I think that's the kind of thing that we need to be looking at. Moi, je dirais, il vaut mieux les avoir que de ne pas les avoir. Euh, même si euh, on risque de survoler les premiers grands titres au lieu d'aller euh, approfondir toutes les lignes, effectivement, et les 25 pages, euh, même si on risque de ne pas le faire tout le temps, il vaut mieux les lire. Après, euh, c'est vrai que quand on s'intéresse à la traçabilité, il n'y a pas besoin d'encouragement pour aller voir, en fin de compte. Euh, personnellement, j'ai toujours euh, fait en sorte de choisir mes fournisseurs par rapport à cet item-là, et c'est vrai que si un chocolatier s'intéresse à cet item, ce n'est pas les 25 pages qui vont le décourager. Mais en tout cas, à votre niveau, c'est bien de continuer ce combat, parce que si on ne le fait pas, ça risque d'être grave et pire pour toute la structure du chocolat, pour tout le monde du chocolat. Au contraire, c'est la meilleure façon pour améliorer les choses. Donc, je considère que, si bien est cierto, le rapport de transparence, muchas veces, est... Eh devaluado o, o, o bajado de nivel respecto o comparado con el fair trade o con certificaciones bio, certificaciones orgánicas. Considero que el, el por qué nosotros seguimos haciendo esto es por, eh, por actitud y, y por mucho coraje a demostrar que un reporte de transparencia puede ser mucho más completo y más justo que hasta un comercio justo como tal o el fair trade y también un comercio de el comercio transparente también puede reflejar eh, toda la capacitación, asistencia técnica, asesorías que, que brindamos a los productores eh, de cacao, eh, cosa que no se refleja en cualquier eh, reporte o que no necesariamente pueda tomarse como, como fair trade. Eh, creo que el, el reporte de transparencia puede ser más completo y, y tomar eh, en cuenta el contexto, tomar en cuenta la parte social, cultural y económica y obviamente la agronómica del cacao y creo que por eso todavía creemos y apostamos en, en los reportes de transparencia porque es algo muy nuevo, algo diferente y que en algún momento eh, va a ser eh, tomado en cuenta y vamos a tener más descargas de los sitios donde los presentamos. Okay, gracias. I'd like to see if we have any questions from the audience. Ah, we have one right here. I think it's uh, it's twofold. One is that we uh, take the um, term of transparency a little bit too small. I think uh, we are talking about the, let's say, 67 cents, uh, which we make transparent if you sell a bar for 390. Uh, we don't talk about the one six, uh, one euro sixty, uh, the bar will cost when we produce it in a small factory. If you do, do a larger uh, factory, it will cost a little bit less. 
We don't speak about the 100% or 50% they take if we bring it to the retail shop. They want to have 50%. That means if you sell for 4 euro, they want to have 2 euro. Very, very difficult. If you then also tell that uh, we as the uh, dealer want to earn something, um, then it becomes even more difficult because um, so everybody was fine when we said, can we explain the 37 cents? No issue. But Mr. Chocolate Maker, can we explain that you get from us 1.6 euro? Mm, no, because you can't compare it. So I think if you really want to have transparency, make transparent everything. So I think that's a plea I have. Okay. Would you like to respond? Sí, no, definitivamente el, el, el punto es, es, es muy válido. Eh, hay todavía ciertos vacíos o inconsistencias que, que posee eh, la, la parte de comercio transparente. Eh, yo creo que también tiene que ver mucho con el, el, el tema de educación o el tema de niveles. Eh, aquí pues pueden observar ustedes está el nivel donde quienes estamos en la parte de cosecha, post cosecha y entrega de un grano seco fermentado, está la, la parte pues que, que ellos representan que es de chocolatería en el caso de ella específicamente y eh, el compañero que es la producción de granos y la chocolatería. Pero los pasos que ellos han dado, eh, no todos lo quieren dar, entonces no todos eh, creen o confían en el comercio transparente y por consiguiente tal vez no lo muestran en sus barras de chocolate o aún tienen eh, eh, el, la, el miedo o la pena a hacer algo nuevo y diferente. Creo que esto se tiene que quedar como un proceso lento, pero un proceso real que, que todos se comprometan a mostrar de manera honesta, directa y transparente lo que cada uno hace y si en algún momento pudiera haber un regreso de ejemplo de una barra de chocolate que se haya vendido a 6 o 7 euros y que pueda haber un regreso en porcentaje a el lugar donde se produjo el cacao en grano, eso creo que también le daría más respaldo al tema de transparencia o distribuir ciertos eh, beneficios, no solo en cuestión de dinero, sino también en acceso a mercados, acceso a préstamos o acceso a créditos que sean apoyados por parte de los chocolateros hacia los productores. Eso también puede afirmar la, la, la transparencia. No solo es hacer un reporte, que, que al final es, es bonito y, y sirve, es cierto, eh, para todos, pero los que están al final de esta cadena creo que podrían hacer algo más con ese reporte y retribuirlo hacia la parte inicial, que está en la base, que son los productores. Creo que eso es una igual, larga discusión que se debe tener, pero com, com, comparto lo que aquí el, el amigo dice, de que, que puede haber eh, algo todavía que se pueda mejorar. Alors, je parle effectivement de ma position de chocolatier, et cette question effectivement m'intéresse plus. Je suis euh, au cours, effectivement, euh, par rapport au prix de nos tablettes, elles sont au prix des tablettes bin to bar de ce qui se fait. Et au-delà de ça, Là, comme je vous ai dit, ça fait un an et demi qu'on est dessus. Euh, on a eu l'occasion de visiter euh, comment on appelle ça une plantation Chuncho. Et c'est parce que quand je visite, je me rends compte encore plus que qu'un rapport peut me donner, parce que je rencontre des humains. On a pris la décision, sans savoir que cela existe, de effectivement réserver un pourcentage de chaque tablette pour une dame qu'on a rencontrée. Et quand on a parlé avec notre sourceur, il nous a dit... Peut-être mieux que ça. Si vous proposez qu'à cette dame-là, c'est peut-être injuste pour les autres, parce qu'il y, y a plein d'agriculteurs autour, effectivement, qui font la même. Et c'est tout à fait logique. Et donc, ce qu'il nous a conseillé de faire, c'est par exemple réserver un euro par tablette pour pouvoir aider à créer un autre poste de traitement post-récolte. Tout le monde est gagnant là-dessus. Alors pour le moment, pour ce mois, parce que le mois où je vends le plus de tablettes, c'est le mois de décembre, ce que tout le monde le sait, en France. Ce mois-ci, j'ai choisi une autre association qui, malheureusement, n'a rien à voir avec le cacao. Et je vais reverser un euro pour chaque tablette pour une association qui s'appelle Manaya, qui œuvre pour la scolarisation des enfants. Donc, rien à voir avec le cacao. Mais en tant que petit artisan, c'est tout ce que je peux faire pour le moment. L'année prochaine, une fois que je vais lancer le chuncho, pour toutes les ventes de chuncho, il y a un pourcentage pour le farmer. Et ça, j'aimerais bien qu'on puisse le développer partout. Déjà, c'est gratifiant parce que rien n'est totalement euh, euh, comment on dit, altruiste. On s'y retrouve, en, 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 en quelque sorte, parce que ça nous fait plaisir, parce qu'en même temps, euh, c'est quelque chose euh, qu'on peut considérer euh, de noble. Mais en tout cas, si tous les artisans pensent 
comme ça, je pense que même si on est petit, parce que moi, tout ce que je prends, c'est vraiment tout petit, ce n'est pas énorme. Si je commande euh, 4 sacs, 6 sacs de 70 kg par plantation, c'est rien. Mais en tout cas, à notre niveau, si tous les petits artisans réservent un pourcentage de leur vente pour, on a réglé quand même pas mal de problèmes. Yeah, I 100% agree. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. J'ai question. Question. une question pour Asna. Oui, vous m'entendez Ok. J'ai une question pour vous. En fait, déjà, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Euh, pendant que je vous écoutais, j'ai euh, remarqué pas mal de ressemblances entre le travail éducatif que vous faites auprès de vos consommateurs de, de chocolat et ce que j'ai observé dans le cadre de mes recherches sur le café, où les baristas font un travail éducatif auprès des consommateurs pour l'expliquer euh, d'où viennent euh, les grains de café, comment on prépare le café, etc. Et euh, j'ai passé pas mal de temps à observer justement ces interactions entre barista et consommateur et à, et à interviewer des consommateurs. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de consommateurs qui disent qu'ils sont très contents d'apprendre des choses sur le café, un peu comme vos clients à vous. Mais en même temps, je dois dire qu'il y a aussi pas mal de consommateurs qui m'ont dit qu'au bout d'un moment, c'était trop d'infos. Et qu'au bout d'un moment, bah, ils il s'en fichent un peu, par exemple, de savoir l'altitude des grains de café. Mmh, mmh. Certains d'entre eux, pas tous. Mmh. Alors, je me suis demandé, et surtout, si vous leur racontez toute l'histoire en fait, du grain jusqu'à la fin, je pense que chaque transaction marchande va durer une heure. Donc, j'imagine que vous devez faire une sélection dans les informations qui comptent. Donc, ma question, c'est comment vous arrivez à savoir ce qui compte pour vos consommateurs Parce qu'il y a des choses qui sont peut-être pertinentes pour vous en tant que professionnel et qui ne le sont pas pour vos clients. Donc, comment vous faites la distinction sans arriver à sans saouler vos clients Évidemment, je me mets à leur place, je n'aimerais pas avoir une dissertation avant chaque achat de tablette, on est bien d'accord. Le, le but, c'est de multiplier les canaux. Euh, effectivement, le discours en boutique va être adapté à la clientèle. Euh, la personne, on, on le sent, quand une personne vient et elle est demandeuse d'informations, elle passe du temps, elle demande à déguster. Et là, effectivement, le langage n'est pas le même. Euh, le, le brief qu'on a, nous, auprès de nos vendeuses, parce que je n'ai malheureusement pas beaucoup de la possibilité d'être en boutique, mais le brief qu'on donne à nos vendeuses, c'est de prendre le temps. Si elle sent que le client il a le temps, effectivement, elle va lui accorder ce temps et lui expliquer tout. Je ne vais peut-être pas dire de A à Z, mais en tout cas, elle va lui conseiller. On propose deux ateliers euh, deux jeudis par mois pour l'explication de A à Z. Hein. Donc, euh, dans notre févri, la personne vient à 19h30 et des fois, ça dure jusqu'à 23h. Où on explique tout dans le détail. Après, je fais un atelier une fois par mois à la Cité du Vin à Bordeaux, donc le premier jeudi du mois. Bon, certes, c'est un atelier dégustation vin chocolat, mais grâce à cette masterclass, je peux parler du chocolat comme pour le vin. Et je peux effectivement introduire et dire la vision de ce qu'on qu a envie de voir dans le cacao de qualité, la filière de qualité. Et sincèrement, à chaque atelier, je touche 44 personnes et quand ils sortent, ils sont contents. Après, effectivement, dans nos tablettes, on a... Et ça, c'est parce qu'on a écouté nos clients. Franchement, toutes ces idées, on ne les a pas inventées. C'est que du feedback client. Nos tablettes, si un jour vous avez l'occasion de les ouvrir, vous allez voir qu'il y a des explications sur l'étiquette derrière. Et dedans, vous avez une carte effectivement avec la durée de fermentation, de séchage, l'origine qu'il a fait, le, le, la, tout, vous allez, enfin, tout ce que nos euh, partenaires nous donnent comme information, nous, on le relaie au client, en format résumé, hein, bien évidemment. Et euh, à côté de ça, il y a le profil aromatique que nous établissons, euh, pas forcément en se basant que ce qu'ils nous ont donné, parce que nous, on a procédé à une transformation, c'est-à-dire torréfaction et tout le travail, à, grâce, à le tra à, grâce au travail avec un oenologue, qui est Henri Fèvre, qui est connu à Bordeaux et qui vient goûter euh, nos tablettes à chaque fois qu'on les produit et nous conseille sur le profil aromatique. Et donc cette carte-là, ça a été à la demande du client. Parce qu'ils nous disent, ah, moi quand j'ouvre l'étiquette derrière et se déchire, je ne garde pas cette information. Donc c'est eux qui nous ont demandé ces informations. Et puis quand on ne veut pas avoir l'information, il suffit de fermer les oreilles, de fermer les yeux. <rire> ok, we can take one more question. Ah, back here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have two questions. A quick question for Jeff, yeah, which is the average yield that the farmers that you work have in per hectare? Uh, so we, we are tracking per acre. It's actually quite high compared to West Africa, so about 300 per acre, which, okay. is, which is quite good. Okay. Y la, la otra pregunta es para, para Roy. I changed to Spanish. Um, 
Cuando un common trabaja con cooperativas, asociaciones, que es normalmente lo, lo más común que están haciendo en Guatemala, ¿qué medidas de, bueno, quizá no es la palabra fiscalización, o cómo controlan que la asociación paga el precio que vosotros queréis al productor? Porque mi experiencia en Centroamérica, en el sistema cooperativo, asociativo, normalmente es muy complicado que el precio que quiere el comprador, si no hay unas medidas de fiscalización y evaluación adecuadas, llegue al, al digamos al productor. ¿no? Normalmente la cooperativa, usualmente por... No, no querría hablar de corrupción, pero muchas veces por mal manejo de recursos o por un mal control administrativo, tiene costos muy elevados y normalmente el precio que llega al productor es bastante menos de lo que le gustaría al, al comprador. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, para esto nosotros eh, realizamos asambleas, se denominan, son reuniones anuales eh, donde se establece en primera instancia el precio para la cosecha que inicia y donde están presentes la junta directiva eh, de la asociación o la cooperativa y todos los productores miembros activos. Entonces, de manera directa ellos entienden y se enteran del precio que van a recibir para que no haya esa parte que lo dices, que sí es una palabra un poco incómoda, pero se puede dar la corrupción lamentablemente. Y también se han diseñado sistemas de trazabilidad donde tenemos, eh, o se tienen listados eh, tanto en digital como impresos donde están los nombres de los productores, su certificado orgánico vigente y también se extiende un recibo, se le denomina, donde una copia la lleva el productor eh, con él y queda una original en la asociación con fines de fiscalización al término de la cosecha. Entonces de esa manera nos eh, aseguramos de que esté llegando el precio eh, establecido al productor directamente por su grano fresco o su grano en baba, como se le denomina. I see one question in the back. Uh, yes, see? it's more uh, it's more a comment. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I I think that uh, the transparency is very. Um, I mean, it's very tricky. Uh, to nobody has really the, the right solution. Uh, but just to share experience, I think something very useful. Uh, and to go back on what the, the señor was diciendo, uh, <laughs> which is a mix of Spanish. Sorry. Um, is that I, I think when the farmer is able to make his own transparency, that's the key. Uh, we are developing a tool uh, through a QR code. I'm, I, I will be hopefully happy to present it next year. But where this is the farmer who put the information. And then on the packaging, uh, also the solution is that because the, the consumer, I agree that uh, it's, it's a pity, but to read 20 pages, nobody's going to read it. But at least when there is a digitalization through the customer, uh, either through uh, the, the famous blockchain or whatever QR code, it's very interesting because the information is made by the farmer and then directly to the consumer. And the consumer uh, doesn't need uh, very cold information. He needs uh, uh, some good information to communicate to the own consumer. So that's why it has to be like it has to be uh, seen as a marketing and communication tool to work, I think so. Uh, and, and that's pretty efficient uh, in that way. And the other, the, the last point I wanted to say is, um, I think the, the, the main problem that we are facing as chocolate makers is that small artisan and middle-sized uh, industry, I think they are really on board, really on board. The main problem is the big actors don't give back to the community. So that's the main problem, because when you think about it, you go to many conferences, and actually there is a main issue on that, because we are from the chocolate industry, and we are talking together. Esteban was saying that uh, is uh, not profitable. Uh, we know all the chocolate makers in the industry, there are very few that are profitable. And even if you sell a bar at $9 per kilo, so it's not a problem of price. Because the small artisans, they are the one giving back, as you were saying, and actually they are doing something incredible, which is basically to reduce their margin, to give back to the community, and we know that we are struggling. We are, in a, we are a middle sized company, Republic El Cacao, but even with the strengths of efforts, etc., uh, it's not a huge profitability business. 
So where is the money in the chocolate? And everybody has to ask himself, where is the money in the chocolate and who gives back to the community? Because with this said and with this solve, I think we will do big things. Thank you for that. And I would add, we're in this very interesting moment where we have many people in this room who appear to be in large part in agreement with the fact that transparency matters. Whereas the, we could call it the private sector, the large companies are still attempting to reach the most basic traceability. They're, they're simply trying to say, where did our cacao come from and can we actually prove that it came from there? Rather than going the next step, which I mean, traceability already exists if you have a certain amount of transparency, which is to say, not only do we know where it come from, but we'll tell you everything about it. Um, it's a real divide between these two ways of thinking, and uh, we don't yet see a lot of movement toward transparency, or like you, like you put it, giving back toward communities in the much larger private sector. Uh, okay, we have another question. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. Yep. Ah, okay. Or even without. En français, pour ne pas avoir à choisir entre l'anglais et l'espagnol, désolé. Euh, qui dit transpa traçabilité et transparence, il y a aussi beaucoup de problèmes sur les certifications. Et moi, j'ai un dilemme. Est-ce qu'il y aura de plus en plus de grands publics qui seront fatigués des certifications et de la traçabilité de papier, de papel, en fait, avec énormément de dérives Et comment faire en sorte que les efforts de véritable traçabilité opérationnelle sur le terrain qui coûte énormément d'argent ne soit pas euh, finalement jeté avec euh, le bébé dans, dans, dans le bain parce qu'il y a eu trop de fausses tentatives de traçabilité totalement euh, incorrectes pour rester poli. Et est-ce que vous, les Ankaman Kakan et, et l'attitude, est-ce que vous ne sentez pas qu'il y a un risque finalement que tous vos efforts soient en, finalement ne vont pas payer parce qu'il y aura trop de scandales qui vont surgir par ailleurs Eh, sí hay un riesgo definitivamente de que pueda verse afectado el tema de, eh, del sistema de trazabilidad y transparencia. Creo que tampoco la solución es crear un certificado más, porque ya hay muchos, hay certificados orgánicos, bio, fair trade, rainforest. Creo que esto de la transparencia tiene que trascender a algo más que sea de buena voluntad, de actitud, y de honestidad, pero el, el cómo hacerlo es ahora el, 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 la gran pregunta, o cómo validarlo y estandarizarlo para diferentes mercados o, o, o países. Y lo que dice Arnau pues de, de República del Cacao, Cacao tiene razón, hay, hay que establecer, eh, o ayudarse de la tecnología y del, del, de las redes sociales y de los networks que, que existen para poder hacer que la eh, transparencia se mantenga viva o que se, se, se mantenga eh, como un movimiento real y no solo como una, una moda, un, un hobby, un pasatiempo más de poner fotos bonitas o de poner palabras bonitas. Creo que eh, el riesgo está en eso, que si no lo institucionalizamos, si no lo, lo volvemos más real y con el uso de tecnologías, con el uso de, de dispositivos, eh, actuales, donde los jóvenes también formen parte de esto, creo que sí puede haber un riesgo de que eh, así como nació, eh, crezca, muera de manera rápida, por así decirlo. Entonces sí creo que, que ahora la discusión debería ser hacia adelante en cuanto a cómo crear esto más real, más, más acertado para todos los mercados. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think it's a tremendous threat or issue. Um, the reality is that the majority of folks in the craft world and the specialty world have, you know, I guess, in a way their packaging is much more of a relationship and an experience. And so I think um, that ability to communicate with the consumer and to relay this information is 
pretty key in a similar way that putting a QR code or putting information on the inside of a bar is, is just another method of communicating. I think um, the reality is that a lot of a number of consumers in our in the 20s, 30s, uh, 40s generation um, understand that it's just a label on the packaging and that there's more to see beyond that. Um, and so in, in, even in the specialty world and the craft world, there's not often a lot of fair trade certification because I think people understand that it's a bit of a low bar um, in terms of the impact that, that is ultimately had on the farm. Um, and they have other ways of, of kind of communicating the impact and the work that they're doing. Um, but I think uh, it's a good point to make about reaching bigger channels and greater numbers about how that's communicated. And I think ideally the companies that are reaching those bigger channels have the budget to fund a communications team to figure that out. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Where's the microphone now? Ah, here it is in the back. Um, I see a lot of um, focus on price, but I have nearly no uh, information about what that means to relation of the biodiversity of the land. So maybe for common cacao, have you considered any indicators or KPIs that are price in relation to hectares, for example, that you could have an indication that maybe this farmer has few cacao to sell, but he is providing some other benefits of the land, so it does compensate for his income in the relation of the land he has? Eh, actualmente tenemos eh, dentro del, del reporte de transparencia un apartado, un ítem, donde se habla del el tema de protección de fuentes de agua. Eh, normalmente las, el, el, el promedio en posesión de área de un productor en, las, eh, en el área donde se compra cacao en Guatemala es de una hectárea. Eh, ese es el promedio. Eh, algunos tienen hasta 0.3, 0.4 hectáreas pero eh, están cercanos a parques, eh, parques nacionales donde se hace mucha conservación. Eh, desafortunadamente aún no hemos hecho algún estudio o un seguimiento en tema de eh, si produce poco, cuánto se compensa por la protección de una fuente de agua o de un bosque. Creo que ese es el, el, el paso siguiente y que podríamos tomar eh, a consideración eh, en, en cuanto a servicios eh, directos del bosque o como servicios ambientales, que no todo pues, es producción de cacao, sino que hay, el, el cacao es considerado como un restaurador del paisaje, y aquí hay unos colegas que, de Guatemala que también eh, conocen al respecto, también es un activador del tema de protección de ecosistemas, entonces creo que eh, en, 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 posible, en los posibles escenarios o siguientes eh, mediciones, creo que el tema de, de de protección de los recursos y hasta el tema de captura de carbono podría ser algo donde un, un productor puede haberse beneficiado, eh, no tanto por su productividad, sino por lo que tiene eh, en protección y lo que le provee a la naturaleza en conservación. Creo que eso lo podríamos tomar en cuenta, que actualmente no, no está visible. For anyone who might be interested, there's a strong resource online uh, called the Living Income Community of Practice. I don't know the exact website, but if you Google Living Income Community of Practice, you can find a, an enormous amount of reports and data. They host webinars that will introduce you to some of the data that this question brings up, looking into how much uh, a farmer might need to make on a particular plot of land in order to reach a certain standard of living in the region or the country where they're based. And that is another resource available to all of you. Okay, I'd like to thank our panelists for this very thoughtful discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for all those of you who would like to continue the discussion, we'll now take a break. This in particular is a water break, and that's on purpose because when you come back at 4.15, we will turn to chocolate and to wine, and then eventually to cider. So please, enjoy the break, and we will see you at 4.15.